I'm Ryan O'Dowd, and you're listening to Ryan's Audiobooks on the Issues Magazine YouTube channel. Today we continue with section 417 of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Book 6, The Technological Frankenstein in the Delphic Oracle. Synopsis. The quote-unquote technology which constructs organisms, biotechnology, is a complexification thrust. The technology produced by the mind of man is a simplification thrust. The second is either subservient to the first or its nemesis. Since in the absence of technology, the evolution of consciousness would be subject to limitations inherent in the flesh which reflect upon the mind, the denouement rests on handling the oracular, mob-oriented pronouncements of the technological Frankenstein in ways which, quote-unquote, force with its help the spirit from matter. We should pay more attention to the old saying, make virtue out of necessity. If the necessary bottlenecks we are setting up for ourselves are not producing theological virtue, we may have only two other alternatives, the obscurantism of a massive socio-economic political breakdown, or the perfectionism of the technological Frankenstein. The technological Frankenstein is not the consumer technology of today, but the controlled survival technology which is in the making. The controlled survival technology is the one advocated by the lifeboat model, where the grimness of the means preempts any possible transcendence. Leaving obscurantism aside, not because it is the least probable future, but because its novelty would be in the shifting of the centers of power and the shrinking of the elite into smaller enclaves of greed, one way of seeing the difference between the technological future and the controlled survival technology is to consider the bivalence of necessity and virtue vis-a-vis life. Virtue without necessity is meaningless, having neither a legitimate origin in stress nor a radiant becoming in creation. It is at most the virtue of the virtuous, the steady state of recycling the self smoothly along the smooth recycling of otherness. Without resolution into virtue, necessity is and remains a fact without transcendent characteristics. The fact is that facts do not make reality, but only sustain it. From this point of view, one could say that history is the flow of the real, functioning as the yeast of life, whose dough or ingredients include fact particles, all the granules of organized mass energy swept away by the storm of the spirit into a premonitory image of a theological synthesis. The technological Frankenstein is the technology of the factual universe. What is the factor that makes such technology a real possibility without even demanding the prodding of malice? It is the one predominant tendency of technology to simple-mindedly cosmogenize, to go through a chain of transformations in every technical process where an initial stage in which a personal need prompts a domestic device, the hot iron, the washboard, the cold box, the winged bicycle, is followed by the successful transformations of such domestic inventions into more and more sophisticated versions. Then, later, but certainly not finally, the hot iron becomes the pressing machine, or etherealizes by the introduction of permanent press fabric, the washboard becomes the super washer dryer, the cold box becomes the refrigerator, and the refrigerated food packet, the winged bicycle becomes the space probe, etc. The device is taken away from the hand of the maker and is thus into a cosmic coordinate of sort, from the particular to the general, from the personal to the impersonal. The more technology serves man, the more remote its modes and niceties. Therefore, it is not any more the smart and slightly peculiar neighbor who is envied for his cold beverages, but the consumer society which forces the voluptuousness of an ice-cold Coca-Cola on everyone, not the rumored heavier-than-air hops of two brother mechanics, but the take-it-or-leave-it global newsreel via Skyprobe, etc. The consequence of such cosmogenizing is a remoteness which tends to present individuals not with processes, but with facts and the end products of processes, the factual universe mentioned above. How evil is remoteness? A school of thought states that remoteness is man's enemy. It says that things at hand are the only concern of the just man, that alienation is the unavoidable consequences of remoteness. It's a soothing song too often sung by opportunists or fools. It's really an animal fancy of post-animal man. What is at hand is nothing but a pre-future. As such, it is the non-formed in quest of a form. To point at the blind spot might suffice to suggest that there is an inner remoteness which is as frightful as the most distant of all alienations. That is the biological remoteness of our bodies. Is this a believable proposition? For one thing, if it were not for such remoteness, we would not be shocked by injuries or by illness. We would be sufficiently familiar with ourselves to take for granted the vulnerability of the flesh. But indeed, our physiological innards are enormously foreign to our consciousness. They are a factual, though remote, reality, and indeed they must be remote so as not to paralyze the whole organism. 
If remoteness is necessary vis-a-vis -vis the inner, could it not also be true that remoteness might be necessary vis-a-vis -vis the outer? Consciousness would then be focusing on perceptions on a few elements selected by the discriminating force of an organism, a focusing immersed in a notion of remoteness, a personal new sphere of light enveloping a sphere of remoteness and working as a membrane of radiance, separating such an inner sphere of remoteness from the outer sphere of remoteness, the cosmos. The inner sphere is remote and asyntropic, the outer sphere preponderantly remote and entropic. The newosphere, as the alchemist, works at the metamorphosis of this or that part of the outer into new envelopes of radiance. If our existence can be described as the reality of a membrane of consciousness interposed between two universes equally unknowable, the inner universe is complex, durational, and bloated, the outer universe is spatiotemporal and expanding, then the degree of consciousness inherent in the sensitized membrane depends on the flow, quality, and quantity of information traversing through and apprehended by the membrane. This situation entails the desirability of an environment surrounding the membrane as rich as circumstances allow, and it is entirely up to the membrane us to see that the richness is made, nurtured, maintained, accrued, and transfigured for the sake of the beholder. Since encapsulated by two mysteries, pressured in fact by one working against the other, the inner remoteness and the outer remoteness, the performance of consciousness of this individual new sphere is ultimately of an oracular nature, ambiguous and divinatory. The power of the oracle is in grasping the enormity of the power of remoteness, and in developing the capacity to use some of such power without being annihilated by the inertial mass of the whole of it. Intrinsic to this oracular power is, consequently, the anguish of the obscurity of both the inner mechanisms, physio-psychological, and the outer elements, physical, from atom to galaxies, biological, from virus to man, social, from cell association to city to god, and cultural, from Adam and Eve to esthetogenesis. To attempt to know all and to be turned on to the whole damn thing is not only a futile exercise, it's a suicidal one, since by excessive dilution it leaves consciousness below the threshold of radiance and the individual blurs into nirvana, the condition of non-being. The ambiguous divinatory working of consciousness is not in the freewheeling mode concocted by the Protestant individualist who has made it, for the simple reason that the two mysteries, the outer and the inner, are stern wardens to the conscious. But neither is it the decomposition of the sphere of radiance into the double sea of remoteness, since such diffusion is a renunciation of the responsibility of God-making, which, which is the truth of such radiance. The ambiguous divinatory working of consciousness is not hindered, but is supported by the rigor of its own necessities. It's in this rigor that, on occasion, such necessities re resolve into virtues, not least the virtue of metamorphosis, i.e. creation. The best spirit comes from the greatest torque, and how could it be different? Destress life, and you have non-life. Joy is an all-consuming stress only touched upon in few and far-apart occasions by anyone. Controlled survival technology parcels out to each monad, each person, that kind and amount of environmental energy, information interaction, computed by the Calvinist computer which knows, via simulation, the future. It has done away with the oracular, that imperative God-making of consciousness which is sandwiched, so to speak, between the inner mystery remoteness and the outer mystery remoteness. Since both mysteries have been refuted by the reductionist dogmatism of, of CST, since the anguish inherent in the mysteries of life has been boxed away, the future is dependent upon the rational acceptance of all the nuts and bolts components of the CST mega machine. The truth is that each of those nuts and bolts has an appendix attached to it. It happens to be a metaphysical appendix, a bundle of mystery and anguish, a person or shreds of a person. Therefore, the true play, as seen by the seer, would not be the triumphant parade of a glorious machine emerging into a better self while plunging into the future of futures, but rather a bleeding monster in steel, plastics, and energy, each particle of which brutally, if justly, lubricates its own interfaces with the had-been entelechy of mass energy, the spirit. Simplification via super-technology is a frightening possibility. The sim super-simplification via piousness is a future termination. The first cannot make virtue out of necessity, the multifaceted and convergent earth crisis since its virtue is the unlimited power of determinism. The second cannot make virtue out of necessity, since what it recognizes as necessity is an insular, provincial, segregated fragment of the theoecological imperative. Therefore, the resulting virtue is the lukewarm virtue of a marginal existence. To ride the technological Frankenstein is to be meat for the meat grinder. To retreat from the manipulation of mass energy is to fall into a state of somnambulism, but still to be sustained by life's manipulation of mass energy. It might be difficult at this point to introduce the idea 
that virtue lies only in the power peculiar to creation. Difficult but not devious, since the road which is neither CST nor that of a fossilized species is the ascending road into creation, the trans-technological road of the spirit. The creation road is not the abused being creative dribbled out by many pedagogues, short in reach and long in opportunism. Being creative en masse is principally an adaptive conditioning, where the harshness of reality is blurred by the different degrees of self or induced deception. An acceptable deception, perhaps, inasmuch as the double remoteness mentioned before is not a small burden to carry, the creation road still remains that which can only be walked en masse vicariously, but at the same time, and not contradictorily, can only be constructed collectively. In the most comprehensive terms, the whole of life is but one creature, which includes the most humble of its particles and is always engaged in its transformation. True humility is the gate through which the vicariousness itself becomes fused into the act of creation, since the humble person fuses himself back into the whole living creature. The humble and the meek are thus the kingdom of God, not at a certain future time, but at a self-creating now of the ecological imminence. The creation road is oracular, since it is ambiguous divinatory transformation of the anguish inherent in the state of remoteness mystery into the aesthetic fragment. But its first act is always adherence to the imperative of manipulating mass energy for the sake of conscious life. It is therefore committed to the technological process, which is responsible for the advent of life in the first place, and consequently the advent of consciousness, a biotechnology now moving into technology for the attempt at trans-technology of the spirit. The technological Frankenstein is in a quasi-coprescent existence which life has to keep constantly at bay. An inkling of its presence can even be traced within the technology of the biological. There is a robot-like savagery in the unbending drive of the organic to carry its own matrix successfully through the tests crowding the road to survival. Cinematography has made visual the voracious drive of the insect. Many science fiction movies are geared to the fascination created by the vision of gigantic robot insects overpowering less beastly characters. The most vivid portrayal of such is the enlargement of insects themselves in action. We do not need to fake robots, we have them in the flesh. Our inner remoteness contains a no less savage degree of roboticization. It's within the Buddha, the Christ, Ophelia, the Virgin Mary, et al. It is the biotechnological robot, a fragment of the parenchial technological Frankenstein, on whose performance our consciousness, our conscience, our freedom, our compassion are constructed. This immensely complex, vulnerable, but harshly determined mechanism is as remote to our knowledge as the immensely vast cosmos, and it is quite possible that if one of the mysteries were to be understood, it would be an outer one, the mystery external to the biological envelope of the organism, sooner than it would be the unraveling of our inner mystery. If necessity is going to be our only creed, we will necessarily be given to idolatry. The idol will be the controlled survival technology. This does not entail the obfuscation of the intelligence. Quite the contrary. It might be the refinement of it to a degree not conceivable now, but it will necessarily be the obfuscation of the spirit, since pure rationalization deals only with the robot in ourselves and with the outer, consequently mortifying that intangible which is the robot's justification. For instance, of the mechanism named Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, the robot has passed away, and as robots go, it was nothing outside of the norm. But its master, Mozart's spirit, and the sounds he made into creations are at work molding the other mechanisms, the thirst for the spirit. The emergency, the condition intrinsic to life, is thus of a double nature, the kind which might be labeled as instrumental. How can the momentum of life be sustained by the physical media? And the kind which might be labeled as theological, how can the sustained momentum find within itself the substance that will make it transcend itself create? If the second kind is starved into the bizarre, see the frenzy of contemporary art, the first will be the successful technological Frankenstein. The frills festooned about it will be made of the shredded spirit of life such frenzy represents. But if the first kind is refused, the momentum will in time dissipate itself into the frigid righteousness of a collective, just suicide. The lust for life must find the stern discipline of nature, proto-human and human, which go together in the definition of necessity, that right energizer which will transfigure necessity itself into the virtue of creation. This could seem as extraordinary demand to put on man, and indeed it is, but it is also the norm, since the extraordinary is life itself, and extraordinary demands have pressed from life extraordinary responses on a continuum of about 3,000 millions of years. 
There's no exaggeration in saying that anything animated is truly extraordinary. But the technological Frankenstein of controlled survival technology has its own hold on the oracular. The computer, not as what it is today, but as the technocrat dreams of it, is the oracle of mythical times. In the Delphic Oracle, the collective unconscious, Jung, was applying while seeking the archetypal rules in a quasi-statistical fashion. As forms in search of a content, those archetypes could find significance only in the essential absolute of the form itself made concrete in the aesthetic object, a speedy living tragedy, for instance. Since the oracle was not bent on deeds but on prophecies, it was statistically computerizing the next event. Its derisive grimace was to be explained by the empty threats of its prophecies, empty up to the moment when they reached the ears of the hero telling him he was after the impossible, and making it impossible by simply telling him so. Beyond that moment, the prophecies would fulfill themselves through and because of the hero's sinful nature. His sins would then be the cause and the atonement for his misdeeds and for the inhumanity of the oracle, the computerized statistician. Both oracle and computer work fatally as statistical simulators, and both are capable of non-comprehension of the compassionate second nature of the living. But, since such second nature is still an infant, or an enfant terrible, both the oracle and the computer lack input from the repository of unlimited wisdom. They therefore fall back on the repository of quote-unquote unlimited chance, statistically structured. The hero is again doomed. The quote-unquote mystique of the oracle computer is irresistible, and it must be resisted. It is right and must be shown wrong. It is powerful and must be stilled. It is totalitarian and must be bridled. It is in the nature of the robot that contains us, ourselves, and must be transcended. Transcendence, not atonement, is the key to the emergence from totalitarian mediocrity into authority. The nature of the inner oracle is to be sought in the difference between its drive, the drive of the self, not the ego, and the statistical drive of the collective unconscious, the Delphic oracle. The drive of controlled survival technology. The biological robot that contains us has tendencies sympathetic to the drives of the collective unconscious. It is one of the cogs of the big machine. The inner oracle is the germ of transcendence, but it's potent only when it can disentangle itself from the cacophony of the collective unconscious. Such disentanglement is the first step away from the totalitarianism of the collective unconscious towards its refinement into a constructing consciousness seeking future archetypes which do not conform to the dictums of older archetypes worn down and away by the durational currents of evolution. Thus concludes the first chapter of Book 6, Technological Frankenstein and Delphic Oracle. Section 417 of the Omega Seed by Paolo Soleri. Tomorrow we continue with Section 418, The Mediocrity of Intolerance. I will see you then. Alam.